Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We have a terrific presentation. We're going to be uh, joined by Steve Racing from ASMGI and Adam Kujawa from Malwarebytes. Uh, today's topic is why are businesses getting hit with so much malware? Once again, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to use the question box in the lower left-hand corner. We'll get to them either during the presentation or at the end during the Q&A session. Thanks a lot, and I'd like to turn this over to Steve Racing now. Great. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, thanks everybody for sharing some of your time with us today. And boy, I tell you, what a what a relevant topic. And so, why are businesses getting hit with so much malware? It's it's amazing that you know the the trends uh, you know that are that are going on these days with malware and various different things. So we're going to cover we're going to deep dive into a lot of that stuff. And I I feel very fortunate and blessed to be joined by Adam uh, Kajewa today from Malwarebytes. Malwarebytes is a trusted partner of ASMGI and has been for quite some time. And, you know, clearly the leader in identifying and, um, you know, cleaning up the mess that, well, that malware leaves behind. But, you know, Adam, thank you so much for being here. And just a, a quick note, thanks for, you know, joining us from San Antonio. Um, you know, Adam's just so everybody knows, Adam's a lot cooler than I am. And just what a what a storied background you have, Adam. Just 15 plus years in the industry, and you know, interviewed by CNN and Wired, and just various different um, publications on malware. And you've been at Malwarebytes now for seven plus years, and and actually run the the lab. So you're you're knee deep in this stuff every day, and I I, I really feel blessed, like I said, to have your expertise on the call. Thank you again for for joining us today. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. Uh, so here we go, right? What is malware? So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about industry stats and those kind of things. Adam's going to, you know, Adam's seeing this stuff real time every day, and uh, Adam's going to cover a lot of that stuff. But I, but I did want to start with just defining malware, and it almost seems a little ridiculous, right, because it's such a common term, and I think we all understand it to an extent, but I – you know, I still see in the market a lot of times some confusion p between like traditional, say, viruses and Trojans and those kind of things and, um, you know, m malware. So just to level set um, across the board, malware is anything really that um, intentionally disrupts your your computer, whether it's your desktop or your server or what have you. And um it's it's a portmanteau basically, right? So malware is just made up. It's malicious software, uh, ultimately anything, right? So it, that encompasses traditional viruses and trojans and the whole the whole gamut. So I just wanted to level set around that, and um, and make sure we're on the same page. So that said, you know, so why are businesses getting hit so much with malware? I, I uh, it's an intriguing question because you know there is clearly a trend upward in that and. For me, it, it comes down to two words, malware markets. Um, what does that mean? You know, what, what are malware markets? You could say malware marketplaces as well, but it's a business. Um, and, and, you know, from my perspective, part of the reason why, uh, you know, the uh, malware in business is ramping up so, so quickly and the trends are really leaning in that direction is because it's there's there's more economics. The economics makes sense, right? There's more there's more money behind um, attacking a business than there is an individual. And uh, the, I you know I pulled something up. It, it's the the reality is that we live in a world where you know malware now is it's sold on a market. Uh, and and again, it's it's a business, right? So if you're a bad guy. You you don't have to build malware, so you don't even have to have that expertise. You don't have to go out and buy a book and learn how to build it, right? You can go to the dark web and go onto a website and just buy it. So for you know for you know probably even under a hundred bucks, and here you could get the professional edition for one hundred thirty dollars, right? Which it just cracks me up, but it, it's not funny. It is not a laughing matter. It's it's gotten very, I'll say, um, simple for uh, someone to be. Uh, an attacker, and um, it, it, it's just, I, I think, you know, when we try to protect ourselves, we have to understand that the the things that we're protecting ourselves from, the people who are the adversaries, they're they're running a business, and so they they want things that they can turn a profit on, and if they have to spend one hundred and thirty dollars, they have to get more than that, or it doesn't make any sense to do it, right? The other thing I thought w that was interesting. 
Um, you know, FUD, we've all heard this term from a marketing standpoint, and certainly in cybersecurity, right? Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, but in, in the malware world, that's not what it means. It, uh, these, guys are, these guys have marketing teams as well, right? It, it, it means fully undetected. Um, so think about that, right? People are advertising malware in a way that encourages people to buy from them. It's, it's, it's just phenomenal. Um, it's, it's, it's phenomenal to me. So what, just a little bit more on the market side of it. You know, what are the markets? And I, I, so there's a site, uh, New America, you can find information on this stuff in a, in a t ton of places. But the reason I like this, this site is it does a really good job of, of, I think, just really defining what the markets are. But the net net of it is a, you know, a, a, a malware market is just a network of, you know, organizations, individuals, and sites, websites. Um, it's, it's the underground, right? It's the dark web. And you can go and you can buy and you can buy anything, uh, quite honestly. Um, just even stuff that, you know, we think is like outdated, right? Maybe a little bit old, um, you know, like the Zeus Trojan, right? It's a very popular, it's a very popular tool for stealing credentials and those kind of things. But it's, you can still buy it, right? You just go to a website and you buy it. And, and next to that, you know, if you don't have time to do it yourself, you just outsource it. You buy it as a service so people can, you know, help you not just build build malware, but also leverage it to, to do exploitations. Um, so what, what products, you know, what, what, what products can you find? I, there are a couple things that are really intriguing about this to me. Um, one, one is that, so this, this company, uh, is, you know, Zero Diem, right? And again, I, I, I just chuckle when I read a name like that, but it's not really a laughing matter, but they have a marketing department. They're coming using you know, coming up with a creative name like that, zero zero diem is zero day, right? That's um, but a million and a half. There's a million and a half dollars. They have an advertisement that they'll pay a million and a half dollars if you can give them a zero day vulnerability on the Apple iOS system. Uh, it's just it's it's astounding, um, you know. So I I think about. You know, I I think about you know like a high school kid, right? He's like, I'm not going to cut grass this summer. It's too hard. I'm just going to sit behind my computer, and let let somebody else build things and and see if I can find a way to make a million and a half bucks. I, I mean, I don't I don't know what goes through people's minds sometimes, but but it's impossible for that that not to if you know about it. Um, countries, that's the other thing, right? So, we know, um, without a doubt, that the U.S. and Russia and China and the and the major um, I'll, I'll say, you know, tier one countries are very active and very well trained, and um, are, are are doing a lot of these these tactics. These TTPs are these exploitations are are, are driven a lot of times. Um, but there are there are countries that just don't have that level of resources, not not the expertise or the people, or even the money to do that. So these countries they go and there are services where they can they can buy this level of expertise it really is phenomenal from that pers perspective so um what's the future so what we're, what's what happens now like where are we going from here i um the the interestingly you know we would be naive to assume that the same things that are emerging technologies above the line right in the in the in the world we live in these same emerging technologies are being leveraged uh, in the underground, right? So artificial intelligence, how do you automate, how do you leverage orchestration and automation? We talk about this in cyber all the time and how we better protect ourselves with orchestration and, um, and you know, how do we automate tasks and the amount of data that's generated is just so vast that we can't possibly, you know, do it manually anymore, right? So how do we leverage um, you know, machine learning uh, to better protect ourselves. Well, the bad guys are doing the same thing, right? They're trying to figure out how to leverage the emerging technologies um, to better attack enterprises and, and, and businesses and, and quite at the end of the day to make, to make money doing it, right? So the two things that really jump out at me as emerging technologies that, you know, we're focused as an IT and security in, in the IT and security world above above the line, if you will, um, figuring out how to leverage those to drive business value. But the underworld, the underground, 
um, the dark web, they're trying to figure out how to leverage these technologies as well. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, clearly, um, cl you know, clearly automating attacks is, is in the future, uh, which makes it even harder to protect against, right? Um, but also IoT, right? So the attack surface is changing very quickly, and the very same things that we're looking at as value drivers for our business, the, the underground is looking at how do we, you know, how do we ex create exploitations for, for this new technology that may not be as mature as some of the things that, you know, that have um, protections already. And then the one, you know, the one, I'll say, common belief probably in the industry is that, you know, we're just not keeping up, right? So the attackers are out outpacing the defenders. And whether you believe that or not, um, the reality is this. It seems like the the bad guys are moving faster than the good guys and whether or not, again whether or not that's true it's still creating a challenge because if if you think about you know leveraging emerging technologies um f from an attack standpoint what what it basically means is you know a, a lot of the detection and again adam's going to cover some of this stuff right but some of the detection is based on identifying a piece of malware if the if the automation can change what it looks like um, you know, quickly and they can launch literally thousands or hundreds of thousands of variants of a, of a piece of malware in a day, you know, how, how, do you, how do you possibly detect that? So I, to me, this just really undermines why it's so important to work with experts like you, Adam, and, uh, and Malwarebytes and, and make sure that we're doing the things that we can to protect ourselves. But the, the reality is this, um, the, the bad guys are evolving very quickly and and they're likely going to find a way to get into our environment. So we, we have to be able to quickly detect and quick, quickly remediate or clean up the mess from, you know, from some kind of attack. So, so how do we win, right? So, um, and this is right directly from Malwarebytes, you'll see this, but the, the, the reality is this, we need to adapt um, to the threat. The threat is changing, it's changing at a very rapid pace. It's changing, uh, you know, very quickly, and we need to adapt. And um, protecting the endpoints is it's a it's a critical area that attackers go after, and we have to have defenses in place that can, you know, not just isolate an event if it happens, um, which it will, um, but clean it up, clean up the mess, and get people back to productivity. Right? Business resiliency is about continuing your operations. Um, so. Uh, and then respond deliberately. What I really like about the way this is framed up, Adam, is that, you know, we talk a lot in in IT and security about responding versus reacting, you know, being proactive versus reacting. And responding deliberately is about knowing that something is going to get through all of the protections that you have. And when it does, you're going to identify it quickly and you're going to isolate it and you're going to uh, clean it up, clean up the mess, and remediate it. So I, I love that. So what we talk about at ASMGI a lot is a, I'll, we call it a holistic approach to cybersecurity. We didn't invent the term; it's been around for a while. But we, we, what we talk about is a total solution does not just equal installing a piece of technology, right? You have to put an enter, uh, an enterprise quality program in place of and and mature it right but the the program should it covers your policies you know it's kind of the grc part of the equation right but it's where you it's a strategic piece like how are we going to do it what are we what are we going to do how are we going to do it and you know what are our slas and what are our what are our goals and those kind of things but all of that stuff is really encompassed in a program you have to have technology today we know that the bad guys are leveraging technology um to to change the dynamic of the attacks um, we have to do the same thing to defend against it. Um, no matter what, what you know, any any cyber initiative that we talk about, there's there's always these three pillars, right? But so program, ASMGI is very strong in technology. We leverage partners like Malwarebyte. Um, they they are the experts in the technology. Um, Adam and his team they are the experts in malware and what's going on in the in the in the day to day. Uh, thing and then the operations, right? So this is the part I see a lot of enterprises really uh, leave leave out a lot of times uh, when they're planning for a deployment. Um, but this was what drives adoption and drives really success rates, in my opinion, of a deployment. Is you you have to consider what does our day-to-day -day operating model look like when we deploy this piece of technology? 
to meet the requirements of this program. And, the, and again, ASMGI is very strong at operationalizing the technology. And so that we carve out that middle uh, pillar, um, you know, for, for uh, partners um, like Malwarebytes. And so lastly, I'll say when you, when you look at um, the technology platform and you're building out your enterprise class security portfolio, look for technology that you can create what we call an ecosystem around. And, 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 and what that really means in a modern technology landscape is that it, it integrates well with and plays nicely with other pieces of technology because there is no one like magic pill to protect yourself, right? And not even malware bytes, right? You can, or malware, and you, you can't just deploy protection against malware and consider yourself done, right? You have to do all of these different things. Um, and so look for technology platforms that really can integrate and create this ecosystem model. And this is a great, this is a great uh, time to bring you in, Adam. And um, Adam's going to talk, uh, you know, a lot about what, what, what does it look like, um, you know, in what's the business uh, landscape and the, and the business climate look like from, from the malware perspective. So um, take it away, Adam. I'll get you over to your next your next slide. Thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate that. Uh, fantastic presentation, you did. I totally agree with most of your points, all of your points. Uh, and oh, I agree. Maybe we ought to talk about the ones you don't. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the, the malware, you know, the ecosystem, the markets, that's something that a lot of people don't even consider most of the time. But yeah, it's, it's one of the main ways, reasons why we see so much malware and so many cyber criminals today. It's, it's because these tools are so easy to get. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you go back five, you know, ten years even, you'll find out that uh, you won't be able to get uh, – you'll, you'll, you'll find out that, that uh, cybercrime is a lot harder to get into back then. So uh, with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as he said, I'm Adam Kujawa, Director of Malwarebytes Labs, uh, one of them anyway. And a security evangelist for Malwarebytes. Uh, I've been at this for a very long time and uh, uh, learning lots of different things from different aspects on the front lines, behind the scenes. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So why are businesses getting hit with so much malware besides the market approach that Steve was talking about? Uh, now this slide has a lot of animations in it in the background, and you can read them if you want to. Uh, they're basically just headlines of the various types of businesses uh, and organizations that have been hit with uh, with some type of malware attack uh, over the last year. Specifically, uh, there's parts of this that are going to be about us observing the increase in malware uh, distribution against businesses overall, and then with kind of a special little focus on ransomware over the last 12 months or so. Uh, and you am sure that you've read all of the various articles, the headlines you see in the past talking about how ransomware is doing this, ransomware is doing that, ransomware is showing up in this city or that city. And we're going to talk about why all that is. That malware itself, that cyber criminals are understanding that uh, business targets are a better overall target. There we go. All right, so all the threats are on the rise. And, and in this chart, you can see uh, that this is between 2017 and 2018, the comparison of both years and business focused threats. Okay, obviously some of the top categories there: Trojan, Hijacker, uh, Risk War Tool referred primarily to Bitcoin miners and uh, various types of software that, that do essentially that. Uh, and you know, backdoors, AdWords, spyware. So we, we see this an overall increase and. Uh, at the very bottom, you can actually see overall detections. These are the full numbers of detections that we see uh, for that period of time. And we saw about 80%, almost 80% increase between 2017 and 2018. Uh, and, you know, 2018, at least the first part of it, was primarily very dull, I guess is the right word to use. Uh, most of it was we saw a lot, a lots and lots and lots of Bitcoin miners the first six months or so of uh, 2018 because in October of the previous year, uh, the value of Bitcoin, you know, shot to the roof, and therefore we saw a lot of miners. These miners replaced 
other campaigns that had previously been going on, pushing ransomware, uh, aging Trojans, things like that. Um, everything is kind of stripped back to what we saw before that period, but for a while there, it was it was kind of up in the air as to what direction the cyber criminals would go. Uh, so, out of coming from the, the crypto mining world and saying, all right, we made a lot of money probably stealing crypto wallets or uh, using, you know, illegal, uh, using malware to install miners on people's systems, uh, let's find the next avenue where there's going to be a better return on investment. And so that that's kind of a key, uh, that is a bit of a key thing to consider uh, when we're talking about malware overall, return on investment, okay? Like Steve said, these, these guys are businessmen. You know, they, they go where the good business is, where the good economy is, you know, uh, and they want to make the most out of their investment. You know, most of these cyber criminals aren't those that just uh, decide, all right, today I'm going to write the worst uh, malware the world has ever seen and then release it. You know, it's usually, uh, you know, bad guy A says, I want to do something, you know, bad. Bad guy B says, I want to create malware, but I don't want to distribute it. So then... You know, A goes to B, says, hey, I'll buy your malware, and then uh, and then distributes it for them. And, I mean, this is a very common tactic that we've seen recently, uh, not even recently, over the last couple of years. And uh, not only has it increased the amount of people in it, but it also, you know, it just makes it a lot easier. So it's a whole ecosystem. There are, there are ups and downs. Um, even things like the headlines that I showed you that you can kind of still see in the background, sometimes articles like that are actually utilized to help sell the malware on darknet forums um, where they're like, hey, our ransomware made the news. You know, we made CNN. Obviously, we work very well, uh, so you should buy us. And, and that's the scary part about all of this. It almost works together, you know, the, the awareness of uh, and at the same time the, the assistance of pushing the malware. So if we can break down these 2018 threats, what do we mostly see? And the top Detections there are, are generic detections. And what, what I mean by that is, is this, okay? Malware today, let's say, go back 10 years, and you might see one, maybe two uh, new families or variants, let's say two variants uh, of a particular malware family. So what, what does that mean? If a family is a group, Emotet, Ryuk, uh, WannaCry, NotPetya, all those things are referred as individual malware families. And so variants of those families are just, you know, want to cry dot A, want to cry dot B, C, whatever. And there's slight modifications being made to each version, each variant, that make it harder to detect and or more effective at what it's supposed to do. Um, as we have, you know, moved into the future, uh, these days there's far more uh, of that happening. There's far more variants being created. And it's not always being done manually by an attacker. You know, there's lots of tools out there called um, uh, cryptors. There's things that are that are meant to obfuscate a particular malware so that it's harder to detect, harder to identify by a traditional solution that would use signatures looking for something that is seen before. So to combat that and combat the increase of that, and you can imagine that right now we're already seeing more than, than most. Uh, we've got more malware than we've got malware analysts, okay, obviously, lots of them. And... That's only going to get worse as we adopt things like AI and what not, or at least the criminals do to help make their attacks uh, more effective and, and pump out malware faster. So the generic detections are meant to look for anomalous things. What is that? Why is that particular application doing that? Why is this particular application doing that? Why is this traffic going by? Why is this file being deleted? Uh, all these things can make up a behavioral kind of uh, identity for anomalous, uh, you know, malware, anomalous software that usually ends up being malware in many cases, and detecting it and being able to remove it without having to have seen it previously. And this is a, a technology method, you know, an ideology, really, that is being adopted by pretty much the entire industry. And we're going to, I promise you, you're going to see more and more of that. The fact that we've been able to name as many of these particular detections as we did is pretty impressive in my book. Uh, if you go look at McAfee or Semantic, and I'm not bagging on those guys right now, but I'm saying their detections are usually, you know, godly good, just four or five letters and some numbers. Uh, 
win32.rs345. I mean, what does that mean to you? You know, um, obviously you could probably use that to get a very specific look at what that particular malware variant could do, but at the same time, it, it makes it more difficult to do things like threat intelligence. Um, and so that's kind of the crossroads for our app, where it's about generic detections that allow us to stop things we haven't seen versus, um, you know, trying to understand the, you know, the traits and tactics and the trends of, of certain malware things. But after that, <laughs> after the generic one, uh, we have sort of a Trick TrickBot, uh, and a few other ones on there that I'm sure that you've heard about recently. Uh, we're going to go into more about those two particular malware families in a second. <sighs> but overall, uh, you know, we saw this, the, the, this is kind of the distribution of business-focused uh, ransomware in 20. So let's talk specifically about uh Let's talk specifically about ransom. So between 2018 and 2019, we saw a 363% increase in ransomware detections against business. That's 14% increase in the last quarter. So basically, the Q4 of 2018 had a massive, massive, massive uh, you know, push of ransomware. Well, previously, we thought it died. Honestly, if you go back to the, uh, you know, the, like I said, when the, the, the value of Bitcoin shot through the roof, uh, we stopped seeing traditional malware. We started seeing more and more uh, attempts to spread, you know, spread crypto miners and things like that. So at the same time, you know, prior to that, there was already a dying ransomware industry. Families like Cerber and Lossy, ones that I'm sure you all have heard of at some point over the last few years, you know, either the people behind them were getting arrested or the criminals themselves were just like, this is too a hostile of an environment or whatever. And we saw a lot of them go down. And not, not many of them ever really returned. You can start to see kind of a shift of, uh, of the difference between, between consumer focused and business focused ransomware. In this slide, even better, if you ask me. So the, the top chart there, what that is showing us is uh, is basically here's consumer detection percentages. Now, I like to use percentages sometimes instead of raw numbers because percentages actually do a better job of showing you the trends, showing you the intent behind it of, of you know the overall movement rather than an individual you know attempt to infect. Uh, so you can see on the consumer side, uh, starting in 2017 Q4, you know, there was a slight increase. But overall, consumer-focused ransomware has, has declined significantly over the, over the last couple of years. And you can see it just continue to rise more and more and more on the business side. Um, the below chart, or the lower chart, uh, also kind of shows the same information, with the, uh, but in a visual way. And here you can see it. Uh, Q1, two, two, three, 2018 to Q4, 2018, uh, that massive jump that I talked about, and what we were dealing with as far as ransomware goes. Uh, and in our next slide, this kind of even more uh, uh, plans at home. So these are actual detections. This is ransomware target focus for the last 12 months from June to June, uh, 2018 to 2019. And the orange there, that is business or organizational focused ransomware. Uh, I like to say organization sometimes because people think if you say business, it sounds like you're saying like an actual business, like uh, a store on the corner or, or someone that sells something. But it also refers to uh, educational institutions, uh, you know, hospitals, all municipal networks, things like that. Anything that requires basically – is not a single network or a single endpoint or a small network, but something large enough to uh, require enterprise-level technology to secure. So here, you know, as we're moving through the year uh, in this chart, it becomes obvious more and more, especially as we get to the end of it, that these two lines are going to cross over. And what that means is that the amount of ransomware we see against business is going to overtake the amount of ransomware we see against consumers. And based on all of the... Uh, uh, trend analysis that we've done in the past. This is totally what we expect. You know who else did this? Emotech. The Emotech Trojan 
uh, actually was distributed primarily to consumers. It was also a banking trojan, meaning that its primary goal in the past was to just steal banking credentials, and that's it. Uh, now it does a lot more things, and we're going to be talking about that in a second, like I said. But there was a time, you know, that we saw last year, basically, uh, late last year, where these two were the consumer-focused Emotet and the business-focused Emotet switched places, and we started seeing Emotet being pushed more and more and more against organizations, large networks, and there's a very specific reason for that, and we're going to talk about it. So, why the shift? Well, obviously, we've seen business tax half surged in 2019, uh, at least double the amount of 2018. On the right there, uh, hopefully you can, can read and see all that. But we have a timeline that just lists out a few of the uh, kind of most popular ransomware attacks over the last couple of years, the ones that get the most attention, that get the most headlines, things like that. Because remember, you know, the cyber criminals, they read the news as well. They all go on CNET. They all go on dark reading or whatever, and they learn about what's going on uh, in our industry and learn about ways that we're telling them we're going to stop them, learn about ways to uh, attack people with, with, with more effectiveness uh, because of new technology. So they, they pay attention. But you can see there, 2017 is just like the one. 2018, there's a few. 2019, holy cow, not even the entire year has already got more than, than both years combined, more uh, high-level articles talking about ransomware attacks uh, against organizational networks than ever before. So that's, like I said, it's not every single one of them that's out there, but it's kind of a general uh, majority idea. So, like I said, important turn to know, especially these days, is return on investment. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know what return on investment means, but if you think about it from the perspective of a cyber criminal, that means what? Well, first of all, you need more valuable targets. That's a better return on investment. Uh, greater ransom or greater data that can be exfiltrated from the network. Is this, is this particular data going to be easier to uh, sell? You know, is, is the ransom itself going to be worth how much money or time or attention you, a cyber criminal, put into the actual attack? How easy is it going to spread? It's another thing you have to take into consideration. Yeah, you can go and spend you know, $500 for some custom ransomware executable, right? Uh, but then you've got to distribute it. Now, you're not just going to go out there and find a free email or whatever malware distribution platform. Usually you have to go to someone who has an established botnet. That botnet can be used to kind of piggyback uh, your malware uh, onto other people's systems. So you got to pay that guy. You know, or gal. I'm not. Everyone could be a cyber criminal. <laughs> uh, but yeah. So the 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 whole goal here is that you have more to spend than you realize when it comes to, to spreading malware to using it as a method of you know getting money from people. Um, and so you take all those things into consideration and come up with like you know a higher chance of re return. Is it worth doing this? Yeah, it seems like it is. The more we talk about it too, and here's the, the double sided sword, folks. The more we talk about how effective particular malware attacks are against particular uh, you know, targets, the more lucrative it seems to those who may not even be interested in cybercrime. You know what I mean? They may be on the cusp being like, I might try to do some ransomware or attack someone with ransomware, or I might just rob someone you know, at, at the bank. I don't know. Whatever they decide to do, when they see this article saying, hey, huge investment here, huge uh, returns for this particular thing, they listen to stuff like what we're talking about. The markets are out there. Here's how you go see them. Um, we almost set it up making more of the thing we're trying to fight against and make it. So that's an unfortunate side effect of all this awareness. You can't just say, I'm only going to make people who aren't criminals aware of how we're stopping the criminals because you can't. I mean, obviously you can't do that. Uh, new technologies is another huge reason for this shift. So not even necessarily new. Y'all remember WannaCry. Y'all remember TrickBot, or not TrickBot, but, uh, but not Petya, right? Uh, a couple of years back, we saw WannaCry as, at the time, being one of the most distributed and, and alarming ransomware families we've ever seen. And I'm even, I'm even on the fence about calling it a family. 
what the original one card was, was like a proof of concept. It was broken. I've never seen a ransomware like that. The fact that it was able to spread so much was not because of how technologically advanced and amazing it was. It was because it used a an exploit that was not I don't know, I guess most folks didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> so Eternal Blue the, all the Eternal exploits were first discovered by or we believe were first identified by the NSA, and they kept them themselves for who knows how long. Uh, then the Shadow Brokers group was able to exfiltrate that data somehow and put it out in the Internet. So then these exploits, which the NSA was using to break into foreign governments, uh, is now available in the wild, anyone that wants to take the time to implement it into their malware. Well, whoever may want to cry decided we're going to do that. So they did. And, uh, and we still see want to cry today because of how effective that particular exploit was. But the thing is, is that it, it also started kind of a new thread of, of ideas by cyber criminals because it's like, hey, we can use the same technology or even things that can help it or are similar to it to try and see how well we can spread. Look how vulnerable all of these networks are. Hundreds of thousands of systems were ransomed when WannaCry attacked. And all because of something that could have been patched and was, there was a patch really available for it months prior to the attacks. People can't update that fast. Cyber criminals know this. People don't even care sometimes about the security, and cyber criminals know this. Uh, and it's because of that, uh, that cavalier attitude towards security or, uh, you know, just really just putting it in the back seat is why we see so many uh, cyber criminals utilizing old, outdated exploits or attack methods to effectively infect people. Phishing which requires fooling someone on the other end, an actual person. It's not about breaking something. It's not about exploiting anything. It's about telling someone, hey, I'm from here. Open this thing. And someone believing it. You know, you think we'd be past that. But that is a still the most effective method of spreading malware today. This chart here I'm really not going to go into, but I know that you all are getting uh, some slides uh, of this. And you can also pause the video if you're watching in the future. Um, and feel free to look. I, I kind of created this chart as a general uh, breakdown of what uh, what constitutes as a return on investment. You know what factors are considered, and uh, kind of coming to the conclusion that it's it's twice as profitable. It's twice as good uh, of a return on investment to go after businesses than consumers, according to this chart, anyway. And uh, and that's pretty cool. So, real quick, why is Emotet so effective? Well, in this chart here, you could also pause it for the future or, or take a look at it in your own slides. But basically, we see Emotet these days, it doesn't just do a credentials. It has a spam module, so it can start spreading itself. And it's spreading itself through malicious email most of the time. Uh, either an exploited document like Office or it could have a malicious macro script embedded in it. Uh, and these scripts are used to pull down malware from the Internet and install it on the system. This makes it possible. Basically, it's, it's a supercharger in that sense, where the, the email itself and the embedded document is not malicious, but what it pulls down is. But you, can't, you couldn't just directly infect the system with the Emotet. You have to find a way around their, uh, their security and then be able to pull it down from there. That's what's going on. It's just circumventing our security and it will steal the contacts from the user and then use that to spread them out or at least uh, send a bunch of emails to the other contacts uh, of the victim and hopefully infect those people too. All right, and, and there's a lot of other things that Emotet can do, and I'm not going to go into all the details about it, but it's primarily been used, we've seen, to not only steal some information but to spread other our types, and this is also a new feature that seems to be commonplace with most new quote unquote sophisticated malware. And that's the ability to download additional malware and that's the ability to pull down additional stuff. Uh, you, we've seen this with rats, with bots, with other things like that. Um, but we haven't really seen it with these guys uh, until the last year or so. So let's talk about TrickBot for a second. How does that one work? Well, there's two scenarios in this particular chart. The first one on the top shows how a malicious email with a URL that is clicked and uh, you know, the user is tricking and clicking, will download TrickBot and infect the system. The second scenario is kind of what we just talked about, where a malicious email is sent, 
there's a Word document or something embedded in it. It has a macro script embedded in that. And once the user opens up the document, it says, hey, this is an old version, or this was created with an old version uh, of Microsoft Word. Please you know, click Enable Editing or something. The, the yellow button at the top, whatever it called that moment. Please click it, and, uh, and it will run the script to strip down with the malware and set the system. You can see that in these slides up to about the third step there. That's when... Uh, Right after that, Enotet will be used to download ShirtBot, and then the same thing will basically happen. ShirtBot has the capability to move laterally throughout our network, and that means that it's using the eternal blue, or all the eternal exploits, it's using a lot of the eternal exploits that the NSA first discovered. It's using brute forcing of credentials to try and move throughout the network. And what I mean by laterally is in, in basically system lands by network and is able to move to other systems connected to that system on the network, uh, that is lateral movement. It's not uh, trying to affect another network, it's trying to just spread on the same one. So this makes it very dangerous, and obviously this leads to other things happening, but if you remember uh, in late 2018, actually very early 2019, big, big thing that was being used, that was being pushed, was what was called, or being referred to at the time, as a triple threat. And that basically refers to Emotet, uh, downloading TrickBot, and then TrickBot spreading laterally throughout the networks until it infected it, as much of the network as it could, and then dropping Ryuk, the Ryuk ransomware. So that's right here. Uh, so this is a quick look. Ryuk was first seen in the wild in 2018. It was used to attack uh, organizations like the like water authorities, cloud backup sites. Uh, it's based on the Hermes ransomware, if you're familiar with that at all. But it did this really interesting thing during the 2018 holiday season, most of the time you see cyber criminals going on their own little vacation, their own little break. But during this period, we actually saw the days, well, the day before and the day after Christmas actually be used to uh, to spread reusing for at least massive, massive ransomware campaign that was undertook by Emotet, TrickBot, and Reuse, and it really uh, alarmed a lot of people. It was incredibly effective. And here's a look at just kind of reuse activity uh, since the beginning of this year, where we have seen, you know, a pretty big spike there. Uh, as far as its trends go, it's been sticking with, with a pretty good solid trend there from March to now. And uh, the little chart there will actually show you detection-wise, saying that we haven't not seen re uh, Ryuk. We've seen plenty of Ryuk. It just hasn't really jumped or declined significantly over the last few months. So we're getting close to the end here, folks. Once again, if you do have uh, any questions, you know, please put them in. Happy to answer them. Happy to look into that. Uh, but beyond security software, what can we talk about when it comes to the future? Um, now, I know that Steve already talked about some of his kind of predictions, what he thought would definitely be happening, and I, I agree with a lot of it, especially the AI stuff. Uh, that is incredibly terrifying to me. In that, um, you know, when we see AI being used by cyber criminals to do things like, well, from a very basic standpoint, scrape information from things like forums, social media sites, or pastebin dumps, uh, passwords, you know, username and passwords, basically being used to create profiles for victims and then using those profiles to make, to launch very specific, very detailed attacks easily and automatically by the AI controlling, uh, you know, this process uh, for the criminal, which would, should increase the amount of return on investment for the criminal. See, I'm telling you guys stuff like that, but, what, you know, there might be one of you listening that's a criminal, and you're like, wow, I didn't think of that. I'm going to go look into it now. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. But as far as, you know, what are we going to see here? Only uh, basically what, and actually, I'm sorry, the next slide is about the, uh, about the predictions. This one, this one's about a plan. This one's about uh, what you should consider and what you should possibly um, explore when it comes to creating a plan about uh, about what to do when you do get attacked, if and when you do get attacked. So, uh, first of all, only IT staff can install software. This obviously is something that is a case-by-case -case basis situation. Your organization is unable to do any of these things, then don't worry about it. Find some other way of doing it. Um, but this is for, for those that can, 
try and limit the amount of applications that can be installed or anything that can be installed by your employees. That should not be something they should be able to do unless you want a whole network full of pups, adware, and probably ransom. Uh, phishing, or, or I'm sorry, a procedure for dealing with phishing. This is something that you would, believe it or not, it's not, it's not common enough. <coughs> Excuse me. There could be an email address, uh, a button, anything, a, a chat room where your employees can reach out to your security staff, if you've got any, uh, or a third party or something like that, and say, I got this email. It looks weird. I don't know what it is, but I'm not going to open it. Can you confirm if this is good or bad? In our advice, we do this. Other organizations, they do this. Uh, it's a good thing to have because we could try, and I, we have tried, to really cram into people's heads, what is it? What does a phishing attack look like? How do you avoid this, you know? And for some people, it's like, yeah, just avoid those. You're fine. Other people, they fall for it. And there's a reason why it's still so effective. It's because people keep falling for it. Um, so education is just one aspect of it. You know, what you need to do is give people an opportunity, give them the technology, the tools to at least report something suspicious because anybody can say that doesn't look normal. And if they can do that, then, then they're one step closer to being able to avoid that potential you know, network-wide ransomware attack. And, uh, and finally, what I wanted to mention was that segmentation of network resources, of valuable network resources. And what I mean by that is that if you are an organization that has user credentials or, uh, you know, customer personal information or uh, intellectual property for your business, all of these things are very valuable and more and very critical if you lose them or have them redu uh, ransomed or something like that. So what you want to do is, is take all that data, identify where it is. If you can, put it behind a little layer of security. You know, put it behind an access control list. Put it behind multi-factor authentication. Put it behind a VPN wall. Whatever you can do, just make sure it is really, really hard to get to for the criminals. You know, and, and you may have to limit who can access that data, but at the same time, maybe you need a conversation of do you need to access the data or not? Uh, when I worked for the government, you know, we had a lot of segmentation of, of rights, of accesses, and things like that. And most of the time, it uh, you know, it made it so that I didn't. Nobody really knew what was going on at the whole time. But at the same time, it kept things secure. And the more uh, the more critical files, more critical information was held behind a higher security than the rest of it. Uh, the point of doing this is a so that if you do get attacked, you can immediately know what areas have the most critical stuff and you need to worry about. But B, it could provide another layer of, uh, basically another layer of, of protection to your network by uh, reducing, or basically by only providing the criminal with the low-hanging fruit, all right? Uh, they want to get that extra information, they'll have to crack through additional security. But why, when you can set up, you know, a fake web server or something that says, Here's all this fake information. Grab it, steal it. I don't care, uh, and they'll go away. I and mean, there's lots of different ways to to set this up, but it's something to consider. You know, make sure you know what's on your network, not just the malware and applications, but the data itself. Where is it being stored? How easy is it to steal? Uh, and you need to secure that. Uh, so, real quick, just talking about the next year, my predictions that I was mm, supposed to talk about earlier. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. So the use. Uh, increased use of manual infections is something we do expect to see. Uh, we've already seen that where attackers will use, do things like compromise uh, unsecured RDP connection or use one of these other uh, internal exploits to manually break into networks. And from there, if they actually have remote access into the network, they can do things like disable security software, launch malware directly. Um, this is a far more powerful method of attack and it, and it causes a lot more damage. You can even use malware that no one's ever seen before. Uh, Robinhood ransomware is a, is a great example of that. That's a particular ransomware family we've never seen in the wild, but we've seen it used against businesses when attackers were manually attacking it. And uh, the problem with this being that if you are not smart, if you're not a smart attacker, then you could very likely, you know, undertake more risk than needed um, because you could be leave a trail back to you, uh, basically, if you don't cover your tracks. The additional development of infection venues, and what I mean by that is that even 
you know, for a while there, exploit kits were all the rage. Everybody loved to use exploit kits. There was exploits being developed and pushed out left and right. But uh, at one point, people started patching, and exploits weren't as effective. So people went back to, or the bad guys went back to pushing malware through email. But instead of it just being like it used to be, where it was usually an attachment or something, they started doing things like adding more scripts, like uh, like finding new ways to, to obfuscate malware through the email client itself, zipping things, using, you know, interesting passwords, just lots and lots of tactics used to try and uh, make this a more believable and more secure method uh, of spreading malware. And we're going to continue to see that happening throughout the rest of the, of the year. Um, absolutely. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but luckily, a lot of the technology that's being developed is for the purposes of uh, identifying anomalous activities, like I said before. And that includes most of the scripts trying to download stuff. Uh, so next up, uh, ransomware will continue throughout the year. You know, we've already seen lots and lots of attention about it. I'm not going to dig deep into this one. Obviously, you all know what I mean. Uh, we're going to see more ransomware this year, so be prepared for that. And then finally, our conclusion, you know, proactive protection is a requirement these days. Most, A lot of malware that's out there, it's not the kind of stuff you can recover from. It's just stuff you have to stop, either stop happening or develop a solution and the, you know, how you store your information, how your uh, our users are able to operate, what you're supposed to do in the case of an attack to reduce the risk as much, about pos as, much as possible. Uh, and like I said before, it's not about if, but when. When are you going to get hit? You can't say that I have a solution that's going to be 100%, you know, protective against everything that comes across and I have full confidence in it. You should not do that. You know, you could put a gate around your house. Would you still expect that to stop anything from ever coming through? You know, you have to consider things from all angles, and that's that's part of this. Is it's even not necessarily trying to stop everything, but for uh, for the, the 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 technology that you use for the plans you have in place to bring things back as fast as possible. Uh, and that's something to take into consideration. You want to reduce the risk, but also reduce the, the downtime. You know, get yourself up and running fast. For a lot of businesses, that's more important than whether or not they lose files. Um, and then finally, this is the new norm, folks. You know, our, the immense focus on organizational targeted targets has really brought a lot of attention, media and criminals otherwise, to this particular method of attack. Uh, this hype is going to bring additional actors to the space, like I said, and it, it's also going to accelerate the development of organizational defense and technologies too. Now, what I mean by that is that while we always are going to see more and more development from the cyber criminals on being more effective at, at attacking enterprises, organizations, etc., we're also going to see more and more resources put into the development of technologies that specifically protect those organizations, whether that be you know, AI type stuff or something else, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But usually one does influence the other. Keep that one in mind. And that's it for me, folks. Uh, at this point, we can answer a couple of questions, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Steve. Sorry, I was muted. I, I was talking to myself, I think. I Thanks much for that. Uh, those insights, Adam. I, very, very insightful indeed. And I... You know, I, I, I just want to queue up on one of the things that you <clears throat> predicted and, you know, the more manual attacks, right? And th there's no question if somebody's kind of hunkered down and just really manually focused on penetrating your network that, uh, you know, that's 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 super scary, right? But the, the thing that scares me even more from a scale standpoint is that, like an open RDP port, somebody doesn't just decide, hey, I'm going to go attack – you know, this business and see if they have any open RDP ports, they're automating that part, right? So there are bots that are just scanning the entire internet, the entire publicly facing, externally facing internet, looking for open RDP ports. And then you get a list, you know, you get a list of what's, what's open and now, and then you got to pick where, you know, where to do this manual attack. And I, I have customers tell me, Hey, I, I'm just, um, you know, nobody cares about me. I'm just a little manufacturer, and, you know, we got a couple hundred employees or whatever, right? And and all we do is, you know, maintenance on jet engines, right? I'm like, yeah, but your 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 client is GE, right? So, 
you know, they, they might not care about you per se, right, from, a, and from an ROI standpoint, but they may leverage you to, you know, there might be some wide eyes on the other side of the table saying, holy crap, we can exploit this RD, open RDP port and attack this mm -hmm. small manufacturer and get to a, a big bounty at a GE or General Motors or something, you know, like that. So the, 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 um, the scary part to me is that even, even though – sophisticated attackers and, and manual attacks um, are on the rise. Um, they're leveraging automated tools to pick targets, right? It, it's not, everybody Absolutely. doesn't have to be, you know, have like 10 million credit cards to be a target. You just have to be yeah. connected to somebody who's, you know, a target. All of these things are, are, are viable. Let, let's jump into some questions because I know we're running out of time. We've got some really good questions, but I want to uh, – let. So here's here's a here's a great one. So, um, do I still need antivirus protection if I use malware protection? Uh, what do you well, think? Well, no. <laughs> I mean, the 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 term antivirus and the term uh, you know anti malware are kind of interchangeable these days. Uh, we don't really see any viruses like we used to. Um, I've seen like a couple over the last year somewhere in Asia, but but for the most part, you know, we do classify a lot of malware as Trojans, but at the same time, it comes in a lot of forms. So an effective anti-malware uh, or malware, you know, defense solution should also act uh, effectively act as an antivirus as well, hopefully with more functionality than, than what you would expect. Yep. Yep. You know, I might just from a, a GRC, a governance risk and compliance standpoint, some of the one of the things that we see a lot of times is people are like, hey, we have to meet compliance requirements. Antivirus is required. You know, we've got some antiquated antivirus oh, package know. running, but we can't throw we can't get rid of it because we, we have to meet compliance. Right. But so what 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 are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, we, can, we can you meet antivirus it. compliance requirements with as a malware you know platform? Well, I know that as of you know, as recently as maybe a couple of years ago, I was talking to guys at our company about the fact that, that there's that, that there's like PCI regulations require an antivirus, and we call ourselves, at least for a while we did, uh, an anti-malware. So we were like, well, what are we going to do? And I, and I believe there has been a lot of effort at, at reaching out to the regulation authorities and saying, hey, these are not, you know, these are the same thing. Uh, can we get the wording fixed? Uh, I think that's definitely uh, yep. moving in the right direction if it yep. hasn't already. Yep. Yeah. And I, I can chime in a little bit on that because I, I, I do know that like from a malware bytes perspective, uh, particularly um, like a, a virus is malware. <laughs> right. But malware bytes is is able to meet those antivirus compliance requirements. So that's that's a good thing to know. Um, what, why do so many organizations fall victim to like simple attacks? You talked in some of your stats about, you know, some some old old manifestations that are still, you know, spreading in the wild, and, and they seem like they're pretty simple, non-sophisticated attacks. Why are enterprises falling victim of those today still? Uh, you know, sometimes it just comes down to just, just dumb mistakes uh, where, where folks just didn't think, you know, they're, they're looking in one direction, the attack comes from another, and they didn't bother to secure that, that particular area. Another thing is they may not care. You know, there's, there's definitely a significant amount of, of cultural uh, – you know, influence when it comes to security for some countries, you know, uh, in the APAC region, we see a lot more uh, attacks that utilize the eternal blue exploit, more so than we see in the West. That is because there's more, more there are more vulnerable systems out there in the Asia Pacific region uh, to that particular exploit, because the culture of that area has a, a different kind of mindset when it comes to how, uh, how exactly they are going to secure, or if they even care to secure. Basically, if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right, in their, in their minds. And so while over here in the West we're telling people, hey, patch, update, always keep yourself on the top because if you don't, you'll get hit. They say, we're not going to worry about it unless we do get hit. And when they do get hit, they usually don't realize it because there's a, a backdoor now on the networks. Um, so that's yep. that's one of those things, you know, these simple yeah. exploits. Simple, just yeah, yeah, just uh, to chime, yes. Yeah, Yep, Roger that. I and I think one of the things that we see, um, 
you know, m most most large enterprises have pretty mature programs, and they're you know they have programs in place that have SLAs and strategies around vulnerability management and those kind of things. But it's still hard. It's hard to patch and stay up to date. And um, as you, as you kind of move, I'll, I'll say into the mid market and to some smaller enterprises, a lot of times. Um, there's less emphasis uh, and and probably less resources um, as well. And so, you know, the, just call it the blocking, tacking of security, right? Doing those things, do do care or you know, blocking, tackling the the day to day, the stuff we all know about, right? Update your OS, patch it. That's because if you don't, there's a bot out there that's scanning for an open RDP port, right? <laughs> or scanning for an old yeah, OS exactly. that isn't supported and those kind of things. Yeah. And they're and they're relatively easy for the for the bad guys to exploit, I think. I'm gonna Absolutely. I know we're a little bit over on time. I got a couple more questions. I'm just gonna try to go through these pretty quickly. So um if you can uh jump on this. So Okay, so here here's a great one. So I have endpoint protection. It's not malware bytes, right? But I'm still getting malware on my network. Um, why is that? I mean, is that something that you guys are seeing seeing a lot of? Uh, yeah, I mean, we we definitely we actually have a tracker uh, that we use sometimes to to identify when our product uh, is installed with other folks and what we catch and they don't. Um, I thought that we might have had a graphic for that, but I, I guess not. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay. But anyway, yeah. But there we, is a URL. I yeah. There is a URL. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll try to pull that. And one may, up. maybe what we'll um, do, j just for the benefit of the audience, Adam, maybe we'll add that URL uh, to the slides because I, I I know what you're talking about. There's a you have an actual visual. It's a global perspective, right? But you see yeah, attacks yeah. that get by some other. Um, endpoint protection tool, and now we're still happening. Yeah, yeah. But the reason that that's yeah. happening is basic. Not everyone uses the same technologies. Not everyone has the same classification standards. Um, you know, some some technologies, like for instance, that that is Silence, it relies they rely so heavily on their quote unquote artificial intelligence engine that uh, you know that they're going to detect things that maybe we don't. But those things may also not be malicious. Uh, and at the same time, you know, like I said, a lot of the folks look for uh, different, uh, you know, different particular uh, aspects of malware. So it doesn't mean that one is particularly better than the other. And it kind of, when you see it on average, that starts to matter. When when there's one vendor that detects 100,000 of a threat and there's another vendor that detects 50,000 of a threat, that's a big difference there. Uh, but there's usually a lot of factors that go into why something is detected with one vendor versus another. And, uh, and sometimes it, it could just come down to the fact that their technology couldn't do it. Yep. <clears throat> and la last question. Uh, I, I, I know we're over. I have a couple of them, and I apologize if I don't get to your question. But this, this one I think is a great question as well. What do you do, what can you do for zero-day attacks since they're – or what can we do? What what do you do as Malwarebytes, and what can we do as an enterprise for zero day attacks? They're zero day, right? Yeah, so I, uh, there. So how do you how do you deal with that? Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of our technologies and technologies that the industry as a whole is trying to develop are those that are looking for anomalous activities. So when that that means that zero day is no longer going to be a problem in the future, um, that at some point we're going to expect every single malware that comes out to be a zero day. Uh, either the malware itself being what we like to call zero hour malware, which is malware that just showed up today. No one's text yet. Zero day exploits being, you know, exploits that, that haven't been patched yet. So if you have a technology that is looking for anomalous activity, even if an application that is outdated starts, is, is exploited by a criminal and is able to uh, use that particular application to, to stage another level of attack, it won't get very far with technology that's looking for anomalous activity from that particular process or any, you know, internet-facing or remote-controlled process. So that's, uh, we need more and more of that is what we need. Malwarebytes has it, you know, our anti-exploit technology does that. It, it stops not just the exploits, but also stops uh, the macro scripts from being able to do what they're trying to do, you know, from a, a infected, uh, compromised application that was used to, you know, basically create a backdoor into your network, 
prevent that from being able to cause any damage? You know, why is Notepad trying to reach out to the Internet? Why is Notepad trying to, to encrypt all my files? That doesn't make sense. Um, and so it's these anomalous kind of behaviors, it's little things that, that we're going to see the technology look more and more for, and that when we get to the point when AI is used across the board effectively and has been trained correctly, that it's those little, you know, tiny differences yep. that are going to make all the difference when it comes to detection. Yep. Yeah. And and part of the way that, that we explain this sometimes is that traditionally things have been signature-based, right? So you look for mm -hmm. clues in the package or the payload, but um, the attackers are getting really smart and sophisticated. So today, a, a more effective approach is to look for behaviors on your network and you'll be like, Exactly. If you're using AI to do that, like, hold on a second, that's a printer shouldn't be asking for that, <laughs> right? That's, yeah, um, exactly. So, in any event, yeah, we're we're it's we're over on time, and I want to be respectful for everybody. So I appreciate it for those of you who stuck around. I did um, do it. Um, Todd Dunphy, who's from Malwarebytes, was on the call, and he uh, I posted the URL. He sent me the URL, so I posted it to that that graphic that you talked about, Adam, and uh, ho so hopefully everybody yeah. saw that, but we'll, we'll try to include that in the, um, in the slides as well. So everybody will receive the slides. And I just wanted to talk, for those of you who have um, been uh, following our, our series of, of cyber webinars and we've been talking about things like phishing that Adam brought up and, and some various different things, we do have an information security summit in Cleveland, Ohio coming up at the end of October, October 21 through 25, and a lot of really great topics. Malwarebytes will be there among, among others, and we're going to talk about, you know, a lot of things in risk management and, um, and some of the emerging technologies in, in cyber. And from a webinar standpoint, on October 17th, we're going to be talking with uh, our partner, Eureka, who, who does data protection. It's a lot of what, again, what you talked about, Adam, in, in that, um, you know, you can't protect what you can't find. Eureka Software has got a tool that does a really good job of finding all the unstructured data that lives on your laptops and desktops and shared drives and various different places on your network so that you can you know, put the sensitive data in a in a segmented place and and build a, a higher wall around that and and those kind of things. So, cool. that that's upcoming. Thank you very much, Adam, um, for all of your help and great great wisdom in uh, and insights today. And thank you everybody for sticking around. Uh, and we'll we'll talk again soon. Bye bye everybody. Thanks a lot.